what we're going to do this evening is, uh, is we're going to have a, uh, a chat with, uh, with Andrew, a um, couple of readings from his new book, and then we'll take some questions afterwards. He'll be talking for about uh, me and him prattling on. When that lapses into incoherence, then maybe you'd like to chime in with some questions. Um, Andrew is uh, really sort of like the hacks hack, I suppose. Um, he came over to the UK um, from um, what could fairly be described as a ghastly colonial backwater um, in about 1990 and has been here ever since, leaving his hometown of Wagga Wagga far behind him in the dust cloud. Um, he's worked for just about uh, every English-speaking publication in the world. The list is so long that I've abbreviated it to Melody Maker, The Independent, The Guardian, The Guide, um, Uncut, and even The Times. So um, there's a fair, fairly broad sweep there. And uh, the book in question is I Wouldn't Start From Here, which is really uh, quite, an extraordinary, qu quite an extraordinary undertaking. It's, um, it appears to be, at first, a collection of magazine articles that have been put together over the last few years of, uh, of Andrew's um, writing life. But actually, there's a very strong, sustained theme that runs through them. And they're held together in a, in a way that's sort of remarkably coherent and determined, unlike a lot of um, collections of, of, of of journalistic memoirs, and there, there seems to be a dual theme running through them. Firstly, um, how it all went terribly wrong, and how it might go a little bit better. So hopefully we can tease out some of those themes this evening. Um, to kick off with, mm. having written a series of different articles for different people as a, as a jobbing journalist, why, why did you decide to put it all into this book? Why, why take it out of the f form they originally published and, and make this collection? What was the, the genesis behind the project of the book itself? Um, it, it, it occurred to me, possibly mistakenly, but I thought not, that I'd, I'd had um, an, an odd series of experiences. Uh, I occupy a, a strange position in journalism as a, as a feature writer for all sorts of different people, which means I end up in all sorts of odd places at, at curious times and not necessarily related to any particular news event or news agenda. In fact, usually not. I'm usually the guy who's arriving when all the news reporters are, are going home. Um, but it occurred to me that when I was, that if I added everything up, that it, it did sort of say something about what the 21st century had turned into. And I had, I had this idea, I think, that the whole time I'd been alive, I was born in late 1968, so the, the whole time I'd been alive, the idea that the, there was always this idea, the 21st century is always shorthand for the future, and I think there was this implicit idea that it was going to be this gilded age of brotherhood, civilization, and progress where we'd all get our ironing done by robots and have fly around on our own jetpacks. Um, and it rapidly, and, and the interesting thing was, as I, as I write in the introduction of the book, on, on New Year's Eve uh, 2000, I did what I always do on New Year's Eve, which is stay inside by myself, because why you'd go out on New Year's Eve is beyond me. But because of that, I was watching the BBC's coverage of New Year's Eve dawning all around the world. Um, and it really did strike me as a kind of uh, extraordinary uh, collective exercise in optimism. And I, I, maybe, I started to think that maybe there was something in this. And of course, as events rapidly proved, um, there really wasn't. So, um, and, and, and I ended up as a result of the events that rapidly proved that it wasn't in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and various bits of the Middle East, Northern Ireland, uh, obtuse reaches of the Balkans and West Africa, where at some level or another, often in extremely surreal and, and somewhat silly ways, the great sort of questions of um, this age were being uh, debated often, for want of a better word, and and I thought that uh, yeah, if I added all that together, it it might add up into something relatively coherent. I thought, or at least hoped. Was it was from the outset? Was there a polemical point behind the book? Was there a, was there a design that you were working towards? Um, yes, ish. In the, the the book, the the stories in the book are not arranged chronologically. It, it leaps in and out of different times and different places. Uh, hopefully, not at random. There's, there is a reason for the structure, and there were there were quite a few nights of sitting up till five o'clock in the morning amid piles of paper and post-it notes, with my brain leaking out of my ears, thinking this has to fit together somehow. Um, if there's a central theme, I think it's, it's, it's intended to reflect the fact that if you travel a lot 
which is something humans are not really designed to do. This has happened to us reasonably recently, and as recently as you know, 30 or 40 years ago, especially if you grow up where I did in some ghastly colonial backwater, um, it would have been remarkable to meet somebody who'd been to a dozen countries. Um, and in a lot of the world, that would still seem a reasonably well-traveled person. If you've been to as many as someone who does a job like mine or like James's, I think you end up with a slightly odd view of the world. Um, but I started to think that a lot of things were good and obviously good, and it tended to be sort of stuff that we would take for granted, like you know, free press and freedom of association and property rights and the rule of law and getting to vote every so often. Um, and that a lot of things were just self-evidently deranged and bad and just clearly don't work. Um, and yet people persist in adhering to them, despite any sort of sense of logic. And I, I, I realize that when you start talking like that in this point of the 21st century, you're verging on being caricatured as a rampaging neocon crazy, which I'm... I have my moments, but I, I by and large, I don't think I am. But that, that it is... It is um, at the heart of it, I think basically the book is just saying, can't we all just get along? Because I, uh, and, I, and there are moments in which I, I, do, I do seek to demonstrate that that is, it is possible. It can be done. One of the, um, we would love to hear a, a reading um, mm. in, in a moment. One, one of the things I find interesting about it and what you just said there is that you, you often arrive when everyone else is going home, mm. which um, shows either excellent judgment or Awful judgment. <laughs> depending almost, on what. almost certainly the latter. <laughs> what? What? Um. It seems to me that um, from you know sort of watching news bulletins kind of constantly on uh, satellite news channels that one's about as likely to get to the nub of a situation as uh, as one is going to fly to Mars by oneself. And a book like this, although it's not breaking news, actually tells us much more about a situation than the news can ever hope to. But also you're working within limitations. I presume you have financial limitations, yep. you have logistical limitations. Yep. What, how do you balance, so how do you select where you're going to go with the resources you have available? And, and given that it's not breaking news, given that you're not going to places that are necessarily hitting the headlines at the, at the time, how, how do you select what you want to take out of those places? What is it that you're, you're looking for for your grand design of, of this book? Um, a, a lot of it, and, I, and I'm, I have this luxury being a feature writer and not a news reporter. I don't have to go where the story is. And whenever I've been in places where there are other news reporters at work, um, and that is not, by the way, to disdain the people who do that because they're all better organised and in a lot of those places far, far braver than I am. But if I, if I go to a place like that at which there is some sort of press conference or organised news event, I think, well, this is being covered. I don't need to be here. I can be doing something else. Um, and I try, and I've been allowed to do this by a couple of very sympathetic editors, I try to get away from like anything, working in sort of any sort of conflict zone or strange place has its cliches, and there's these things you always feel obliged to do, like interview victims, interview soldiers, interview. There's the, there's the usual round, and it, and it, it starts to it starts to feed on itself. Um, what I look for, I, I try to leave enough time and space for for happenstance, for things to just happen, to be able to follow, you know, something that might just occur, and, and sometimes strange things do, but. I'd like to try and come away from a place like that with, without sounding too lofty about it, try, just trying to come up with an illustration of that place I think people who haven't been there, who live where I normally live in a sort of prosperous first world circumstances, but to try and give them something they might be able to identify with. Um, and I, no, I, I think it's, it's only natural that the things that you remember the most and the things that affect you most are the things that give you that slight creeping sense of there but for the grace of whatever. I mean, the, the, the illustration, I think there's a... I spent some time in Baghdad in May 2003 just on the heels of the, um, the Anglo-American invasion of Iraq. And, I, you know, I, I met victims and I met soldiers and I met the people you would expect to meet. But the ones that... Uh, the people I, who I remembered the most, and the, and the ones that I got the most feedback about when my original piece ran, was I met some telephone engineers uh, in the wreckage of the major telephone exchange uh, in Baghdad. And this building had been gutted. The Americans had blown it to bits, and then Iraqi looters had been through it, and just it was barely recognizable as a building. But in the middle of this absolutely apocalyptic scene, there was a group of men, all wearing smart, casual office clothes, 
sitting at a table uh, surrounded by dented filing cabinets uh, and, and drinking coffee. Uh, and I sort of introduced myself and asked them what they were doing. And one of them said, well, we work here. And I said, you can guess where I'm going with this. And they said, well, yes, obviously, there's not so much we can do here at the moment, but we've tidied the place up as best as we can. And um, you know, one day, hopefully, inshallah, um, there'll be work we can do here. And I just thought, you know, they, they were nice guys who were trying to stay sane in a completely insane situation. And I, it just struck me that they're just the people you never, ever see on the news. Those guys are never going to get interviewed because they don't really have that exciting a story to tell. They're just nice people doing their best. But, I mean, as you would know as well, when you actually go to these places, that's what most of the people are. Uh, and they're always the ones who get forgotten about. I mean, it's sort of part of the, 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 the way in which the book is presented, the sort of the, the PR behind the book, it's sort of, it's, it's slightly flippant. And it's... It, I am it, slightly it, flippant. It, <laughs> I mean, it's very funny. I mean, it, comes, it comes across in its, in its, in, in its, in its presentation as something which is sort of nudging towards um, sort of enlightened tourism. But actually, it seems to me that in fact it's, it's quite, a, that's quite disingenuous. It's in fact quite a serious journalistic endeavour. I mean, going back to the, the, the man in the streets who you never speak to, it, it's almost as if the, when you see the sort of stand-ups repeated every half hour on the news of someone wearing a beige jacket and tie telling you something that's fairly incoherent about somewhere that's fairly incoherent and that's been bombed to pieces and there are all these sort of people walking around in the background and you wonder who, who are they and where are they going it seems that this book attempts to answer that question who are they and where are they going uh, if, if that's if it does get across any of that that would be a, a major result from my point of view because what, what I always wonder about those places that you do see very fleetingly on the news and and you know, I have my restrictions on what I can do, and as, as do they. There's only so much you can do with a 30-second news grab, but I do always wonder about a place like that. When you go there, what do people eat? What do they talk about? What do they think's funny? What music are they listening to in the evenings? Um, and it's, it's also really interesting that this the way that people in these places will open up to you if you go there, obviously not as just, you know, another foreign correspondent. If you're actually interested in what they do and what they're like and what they... Yeah, just their ordinary lives as opposed to you know, their news value that you can get quite extraordinary access to and extraordinary revelations from people. I'm sure everyone here, of course, has their own copy and have, have read it. Um, and if you haven't, um, then at the end of this, the, you will be able to purchase a copy. And if you're very lucky, you may even be able to go home with a rare uh, unsigned edition. Um, but f uh, f for those people here who haven't had the uh, inestimable pleasure of, of, of leafing through this hefty tome, perhaps you could um, give us a rundown of the different places that crop up in the book, the locations you go to, and then perhaps we can have a reading. OK, I'm going to cheat because I can't remember all of them myself. Um, this would be a, a partial list of some of the locations featured, but... Uh, yeah, Afghanistan, Israel, New York City shortly after September 11th, Kosovo, Albania, Lebanon, Tunisia, Baghdad, Srebrenica, Afghanistan again, Taiwan, Abkhazia, Luxembourg, and there is a reason for that, um, which is not just to say there's a reason for the chapter. There is actually a reason for Luxembourg, which is something I, I doubted before I went there. But um, uh, Kosovo again, uh, Cameroon. Bless it. Um, North, Northern Ireland, Serbia, Iraq, Albania, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, quite a lot of that actually. Gaza, Libya, uh, various bits of Europe, um, and, and a special afterward, in fact, for the UK edition set in London. So even if you've already got the Australian edition, it's, it's worth buying all over again. <laughs> Dr. Asia. Okay, well, I, I'm going to do two readings, um, which I think between them illustrate the central dynamic uh, of the book that James um, mentioned earlier. Most of the book, to be honest, is a certain, uh, is sort of a willful hell in a handcart Jeremiah. I mean, the subtitle in the UK edition is the 21st century and where it all went wrong. Um, so that gives you some idea of the general tone of it. Uh, and this is pretty much epitomizes it because this was about a day spent in pretty much the most depressing part of the most depressing place I've ever been, which is the Khan Yunus refugee camp in, in Gaza. Uh, this was in 
Two, early 2005, so the Israelis had not withdrawn such as they subsequently did from Gaza at this point, and by Gaza standards, January 2005 was noticeably bad. But anyway, this is uh, Khan Yunus. Um, I'd lugged my flak jacket to Gaza because I was scared and paranoid and then didn't wear it because I was embarrassed and self-conscious about the fact that none of the people who had to live there owned one. Uh, wearing a flak jacket when hanging with locals who aren't always feels a gross breach of etiquette. So I didn't wear it in Jabali or in al Baraj, which wasn't a problem because nobody shot at me, and I didn't wear it in Khan Yunus, which was a problem because somebody did. Or at least I think they did, and not being sure if you're being shot at is worse than knowing you're being shot at. <laughs> In the latter case, you at least have some idea of which direction to run. I'd finagled a ride to Khan Yunus with a Palestinian UN employee who I'll call Ahmed. We'd driven south from Gaza City, an armoured staff car, a UN flag flying from its roof. I'd figured that riding with the UN would be safer than taking my chances with public transport and Israeli checkpoints. It had been bad, or worse than usual, in Khan Yunus. The previous week, the Israel Defense Forces had barged into Khan Yunus refugee camp after Palestinian mortar attacks on nearby Israeli settlements. The IDF had killed nine people, including a teenaged boy and a handicapped man, seriously injured a couple of dozen more, and smashed up a bunch of houses in a marketplace. The final score, according to Ahmed, had been 13 abodes flattened, 40-odd more damaged, 100 people rendered homeless. Ahmed, and a local UN employee who I'll call Omar, was showing me the muddy lot imprinted with tank tracks which had been the local market when I heard shooting. One shot, two shots, three. I'd already been unhappy about standing on exposed ground in view of an Israeli watchtower. There was a fourth, fifth and sixth shot and I gave voice to my reservations. <coughs> Don't worry about it, said Omar. I explained that I rather thought I would worry about it. They are probably, decided Ahmed, not shooting at us. They can see that we are UN. He indicated the fluorescent blue UN bibs we were wearing. A seventh shot, an eighth. It's okay, said Ahmed, squinting at the tower. Ahmed's confidence, but I didn't share it. I couldn't help but recall the ghastly footage of the last moments of James Miller, murdered by an Israeli sniper while wearing a flak jacket marked press and walking under a white flag. It's probably those kids, Omar said, pointing towards a football game, taking place on another bit of ground the Israeli tanks had flattened. If they get too close to the tower, the Israelis fire warning shots. Yes, agreed Omar, with the air of a man concurring that it might rain later. It's the kids. At least, I assume that's what he said. By the time he'd got, he got as far as it's, I was 20 metres away behind a building. Ahmed and Omar caught up with me presently, clucking amusedly at the new kid in town. Khan Yunus, said Omar, is a crazy place. We plodded further into the camp, following the trail of mayhem the Israelis had blazed a few days previously. The IDF claimed, as they always did, that they'd steamed in responding to attacks by Palestinian militants. This was true inasmuch as mortars had been launched from Khan Yunus into nearby settlements, but it also implied that the Israelis had targeted the perpetrators of those attacks. They hadn't. They'd rolled out of their base, walloped whatever was convenient and gone back home. It was like reacting to a noisy party on the other side of your block by walking across the landing and thumping your neighbour. Ahmed Nomar took me to a school which had marked one perimeter of the Israeli incursion. The Israelis had leveled the building alongside it, pushing glaciers of mud and rubble through the walls and windows of the classrooms. Out the window, I could see a lone child carting a tree trunk across the wasteland the Israelis had created, firewood for home. The school caretaker, who would presumably have to sweep up this mess, made us tea and presented me with a sculpture made of seashells. We sat glumly and silently. Above the veranda around the school's courtyard, signs bearing ennobling slogans in English hung from the iron beams which propped up the tin roof. The one directly outside the caretaker's room read, do as you would be done by. I very badly wanted to unbolt it, tuck it under one arm and walk from Khan Yunus to Damascus via Tel Aviv, Hebron, Jerusalem, Ramallah, Tiberias and Beirut, swatting everyone I encountered en route over the head with it. Yeah, Khan Yunus. Yeah. Not right. a great place for restoring one's faith in humanity. Yeah. Yeah, mar mar Marvellous. Um, let's, co let's, let's come to the second reading in, in, in a bit. I'd just like to ask you a bit about, about that first. And um, what's the, um, you know, the, 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 so the, sub, the subtitle of the book is where, where, it, all, where it All Went Wrong. Yes. At right? the risk of eliciting an incredibly <laughs> obvious answer. Where, where do you think it did all go wrong? What's the, what's the jumping off point for this? Um, the obvious jumping off point, or well, there's two. The, the, the opening setup of the book, the first chapter is set in Jerusalem in the summer of 2000. 
uh, and bizarre though this now seems, uh, it was actually all right in Jerusalem in the summer of 2000. I mean, the Oslo peace accords were imperfect, as all such settlements are, but it was holding up okay. The Pope had been to visit, there were lots of tourists, uh, and I'd been sent there by the Sunday Times travel section, which in itself tells you quite a lot about what Jerusalem was like. I mean, this is a place that had been at various points an outright war zone, and they were suggesting go and write a cuddly travel piece about it. And in a coincidence, I, and I would not dare make this up, um, I went home, had a, I had a whale of a time in Jerusalem, it was great fun, went home, wrote you know, 1,200 cuddly words saying, Jerusalem, it's great. Um, emailed the copy to the section editor, made a cup of coffee, sat down and watched the news, which was carrying breaking coverage of a surprise visit to the Temple Mount by Ariel Sharon. And literally that afternoon, the phone rang from somebody at whichever PR company who handled the Israeli Ministry of Tourism's account, just saying, is that story ever going to run, do you think? Uh, I said, I wouldn't have thought so, no. And it never did. Um, and the second chapter of the book is set in New York City in October 2001, at which point it was, it was fairly apparent that we had not learnt an awful lot in the preceding 20, 20 centuries at several fundamental levels. Um, I, I think if there's one point we can say, or one reason why it all went wrong, it's just sort of just failing to figure out some very basic stuff, but that is the, the human story in a nutshell, I think. The, the, the book seems to have quite a lot of um, uh, encounters with people who are trying to to also figure out where it's gone wrong and, yep. to, and to write it. Yes. And a very great number of the people that you encounter are trying to write it um, by making sure that there are as fewer people as possible on the other side of the fence. And yes. these conflicts seem, in the way that you've written about them and, and your opinions about them, seem to be triggered by incomprehensibly ridiculous um, causes quite often. Yeah. And I kind of wondered, you know, the, the, the way in which you feel about the conflicts you're reporting, because we have this sort of grand picture of, you know, the visit to the Temple Mount, mm. and, which, I mean, is an extraordinary piece of timing. <laughs> and without any irony whatsoever. Um, and then obviously 2001. Uh, 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 but I, I, I wondered how you feel about the actual, the actual people who are prosecuting conflicts that you, that you visit. I mean, do you have any sympathy for what, they, for what they're doing? Sometimes, yes, and, 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 who, and who and why. And, and, and sometimes it's surprising, and, and sometimes limited sympathy in some respects and just not in others. There's quite a long section in the book about visiting Lebanon as, well, substantially as a guest of, of Hezbollah in, in late 2001, which was an interesting time to be visiting an organisation like Hezbollah for all sorts of reasons, uh, who... And the, the reason I went to visit them was I, I thought at this, it was shortly after the US State Department had reissued their list of terror organizations, but at that point very much with the implicit rider that we're not just calling people names anymore. Um, we are going to get these people. And I thought, just thinking as a, you know, a freelance feature writer trying to make a living, I thought, well, it would be kind of interesting to go and talk to one of these organizations and see how they feel about that. And so I looked at the list, and so at the top of the list is obviously Al-Qaeda, who weren't doing a lot of press at that point. So I thought, well, not them. And the second most obvious name on the list was, was, was Hezbollah, the Lebanese Party of God. And I thought, well, you can only ask. Uh, and at that point, ludicrous though it seems, there actually was a website, um, www.hezbollah.org, um, contact. Um, so, you know. What harm can it do? I emailed them and said, you know, chaps, here's the thing. Um, they, they, did, they, they did actually be replied. Uh, and I, it, it shouldn't be. There's no reason at all why they shouldn't be using a computer. But I mean, I, I think it was just the, there's just that residual thing in your head thinking as a journalist getting in touch with Hezbollah, or ideally I should be being blindfolded in the back of a van and, you know, hustle to meet people in a sandbag basement somewhere. But they sort of emailed back and said, look, things are a bit, you know, weird at the moment. Um, <laughs> I, and I said, well, you know, 
fair enough, chaps. But um, if, if, if that changes, um, do, do, do get in touch. Uh, and they did. Uh, six weeks later, they said, uh, yeah, anyway, things seem to have calmed down a bit. So if you're still interested, then you know, um, you know, you're more than welcome. I, you know, I sort of banished unworthy thoughts. That, you know, they'd been renovating the basement and trying to remember where they'd put the handcuffs. But um, th they, they were interesting because I, I think, like, a lot of people, you know, they're, they're an incredibly recognisable brand image, and I, I just say you get this image of sort of violent, bearded fanatics, um, and they weren't like that. Uh, and it surprised me, and I ended up, I remain very conflicted about them, um, in that at a huge, broad level, I couldn't disagree with them more about most things, um, but as in terms of their resistance to the occupation of their country, that was perfectly fair enough, I thought, and it indeed is under international law, and they had no doubt about it at all waged that battle with considerable uh, resource ingenuity and what can only be described as courage. And their leadership, and I met their leadership up to and including the Deputy Secretary General, um, Sheikh Naim Qasem, were extraordinarily smart, very focused, very serious people, um, and definitely bound by a, you know, a, a very, very real and weirdly, I think, reliable code of morality. I mean, I still, I don't like them, and I wish they didn't exist, and I wish they weren't there, and I understand Israel's objection to the fact that they do exist where they exist. But that, that was an interesting moral climate to wander into. I mean I, 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 ha, I mean, I kept thinking about the difference between that and the story I'd done in 1998, which isn't in the book because it falls outside the 21st century thing, when I'd, I'd ventured, um, for reasons which seemed a good idea at the time, to Afghanistan to try and interview the Taliban, um, which I did. Um, and they really just were a collection of fairly dim-witted headbangers who it wasn't difficult to dislike at all. Uh, so yeah, sometimes it surprises you, and then and there's there's quite a lot in the book about Northern Ireland, in which and various meetings with some of the principal animators of that conflict, um, notably a long and slightly peculiar conversation with Jerry Adams, and a, a shorter but no less peculiar one with with Ian Paisley, um, and another one with the loyalist hitman Michael Stone when he was attempting to relaunch himself as a as a surrealist painter. Seriously. Um, <laughs> This is why I don't make things up, because you can't, um, or nothing that good. Um, none of whom I have any time for whatsoever, because that just struck me always and strikes me now as a, a fabulously unnecessary conflict. Quite, I mean, to play devil's advocate slightly, I mean, some of the, some of the, the, the conflicts that you're reporting on, particularly Northern Ireland, mm. and perhaps I feel that like this because Northern Ireland is, you know, very close to home. Yeah. Um, and it's a long way from Wagga Wagga. Mm. Um, but then, in fairness, <laughs> my, Where most is places it? are. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, sometimes, I mean, the, 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 the book's incredibly funny and it's incredibly touching. It's also incredibly infuriating. Good. Because, you know, there's, there's always this feeling, uh, sort of every page turn, is that, you know, you almost want you to do, the reader wants you to do the standard journalistic thing and go into the kind of nitty gritty of the whys and wherefores, but you very rarely do. Mm. And it's, it's, very, it's very much personal observation, which at times um, can be quite um, potentially um, infuriating, not to say almost enraging. But then, of course, one's won over by this charming sense of humour that you managed to pull out the bag, fortunately for you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wonder, in a case like Northern Ireland, for example, it's, I mean, coming from a, a very comfortable, yep. um, not to say privileged background in Australia, yep. having then have yourself become a traveller and a foreigner in another land. Yep. It's, without being sort of presumptuous, it seems, and, and knowing you as I do, it, it seems sort of um, not um, unreasonable to say that you've probably not had to fight for anything yourself. Absolutely true, yeah. And consequently, there are times, for example, in, in the context of Northern Ireland, for, exa for example, it seems that sometimes perhaps you have difficulty, therefore, in understanding why other people would feel it necessary to fight. 
Uh, absolutely true, and a, and, a, and a perfectly fair observation, which you could make about um, anybody who's grown up in Australia at any point in the last 60 years. It's about, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute lottery win. It really, really is. Um, and that question's come up a few times when I've gone into all sorts of conflict zones and sort of asked vaguely presumptuous questions. And it's one that gets thrown back at me a lot. And I think it probably gets thrown back at any person from a reasonably privileged and safe place a lot. It got thrown back at me by the you know, rank and file Hezbollah guys I met, especially their wounded veterans who I met at one of their hospices in, in Beirut. And when I sort of was asking, you know, the was it all worth it variety questions. And they said, well, if your country was attacked, would you not? And my answer to them, which is, my, which is also going to be my answer to you, is I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to understand what that feels like, because I don't know. Uh, and I always have the option, as anybody in my circumstance does, when kind of surrounded by trouble and chaos and nonsense, is to think, well, I can just think, you know, I'm bored or I'm frightened and I don't want to be here, I can go home now. And they can't. Um, Northern Ireland, I think, baffles me more than most because of most of the conflict zones I've written about, it's the one most similar to where I come from. You know, people speak the same language, there's the same cultural references. Um, it's quite a familiar place in many, many respects. Uh, and yet, you know, by way of demonstrating, I guess, that, you know, 20th century Western Europe is not immune from such things, it did, uh, you know, it, it did de de degenerate the way it did. Um, and the, the stuff about Northern Ireland, I, I think it's an, it is an absolutely honest attempt on my part because I'm genuinely bewildered as to how a place like that, full of you know, educated, smart people, ends up in this sort of situation. Uh, so, I mean, some of the examples are possibly not necessarily representative of Northern Ireland. I mean, the, 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 sort of the, the account of the day I spent with Michael Stone talking about his art exhibition um, is there basically as an attempt to illuminate what the mindset of the absolutely irrecoverable terrorist can look like. And as Stone would subsequently demonstrate, he really is just as mad as a bucket of eels and there probably wasn't um, all that much reasoning with him. The, Jerry Adams was an interesting person to talk to at length because he's clearly not a stupid man um, and clearly somebody who you would have thought would have should surely have had the wit to think of some other way to pursue what he wanted, which he eventually did, uh, but it was the fact that it took him 30 years to get around to it, which is what perplexed me about it. Did that even go close to answering your question? Well, we'll come back to questions from the audience at the end, and I, I guess we'll find out. Um, I, um, before we have another, another reading, I just, just, it sounds like <laughs> Many in church, another reading, <coughs> and I do know your love of institutionalised religion. Um, I wonder another recurring theme. Another the recurring book, yeah. theme. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm kind of torn to ask you about that, and also that your sort of foreignness, kind mm. of intrinsically. I mean, yeah. where, where, the fact that you, you've you've chosen to make this your home. Yeah. For the last um, 18 years. And you've sort of had this as a base, and you've travelled out to other countries from the UK. Do you what, what? What is it about? Is, is there anything about being a sort of, uh, an, in some sort of self-imposed exile from Europe, from where you you grew up, where your antecedents are? Does that affect the way in which you write? Does it affect the way in which you uh, uh, approach conflict? Particularly? Um, possibly, but. Probably in ways I'm not necessarily aware of. Uh, I think, uh, I, I mean, I, I was asked about this, and the book came out in Australia last year, and I was asked about this a lot in Australia, and I started to think there was something in it because so many people kept asking about it. They said it does read like a very, you know, for good and for ill an Australian's view of the world. And I, I think that's a lot to do with coming from what is still a new country, a relatively young country, at least Australia, and it's, you know, in its, in its present form. Uh, you know, it was only federated as a nation in 1901. It's a very young country, um, but doesn't have the attendant baggage of being any particular sort of superpower in the way that the United States, which is also a young country, does. So you're, you're liberated at that level because you're not bringing any of this sort of baggage. You're also liberated, I have to say, and I often feel guilty about what an advantage this is, that people impute less baggage to you. I mean, it's... 
I, I, you know, I, it does annoy me when it happens, but I'm not ungrateful for it. Because normally when I turn up in any sort of conflict zone in the Middle East in particular, the first assumption people will make is that I'm American or I'm British. And then when I say, no, I'm not, I'm Australian, the tendency is that they do relax a little bit. Not as much as they used to, because Australia has, of course, um, been involved uh, very much in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, our then Prime Minister doing his usual sterling job of banging the coconuts together. Um, so it, it, it's not, you're not as buffered as you once were as an Australian, but it, it does, it does mm -hmm. buy you some mileage, and I think, yeah, because people react to you differently. Actually, on, on, on that, since how do you feel about um, your former Prime Minister having banged his nuts together and unusually now having a, an Australian presence in um, some of these conflicts, particularly I mean, when I got back from Afghanistan, I was intrigued to see there a lot of Australian special forces who are very active. Yep. Um, I mean, from, from my reading of... of your portrayal of, say, British deployment in Basra, for example, um, you seem to be very warmly enthusiastic about the, the troops themselves and, and a great deal of sympathy for the situation that they found themselves in. I mean, what, what, what's your feeling about your own countrymen now? Uh, similar, in fact. I mean, my, my views of this are a little bit skewed by the, the way I grew up. My, my father was a soldier in the Australian Army, so I, I grew up you know, on Australian army bases, knowing mm. lots of soldiers. Mercifully, we were never forced to do the whole kind of father away on a combat tour thing. He missed Vietnam narrowly a couple of times. I remember him being nearly about to go and then didn't. Um, so I, I, I kind of, I, I think I... I should, should add at this point that Andrew's father was in fact not just a soldier, but the chief of the defence staff. <laughs> Vice chief. Sorry, really. vice um, chief. Technically, yes, I should yes. say, but and that was quite late on. Mm. Um, obviously, well, one would hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you it is Australia, mind you. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't yeah. start off in that job. Um, mm. No, my my my. my the, the 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 story you mentioned in Basra, which is some time I spent with the uh, Welsh Guards Company in Basra at the beginning of two thousand and five. Uh, I hope comes across as a reasonably sympathetic portrait of good men doing an absolutely impossible job uh, as, as best they could with, I thought, uh, extraordinary uh, grace and reserve. I mean, the fact that that particular company, a, you know, and they're, they're guardsmen, they're serious infantry soldiers, they got through a six-month tour without firing a shot between them, which I think was a, a staggering accomplishment. Uh, and I admired the fact that they were genuinely proud of that. Yeah, the safety catches at the back. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Australian involvement in Afghanistan, I have uh, absolutely zero issue with because, as I think possibly the book makes fairly clear, I th really think the only thing largely wrong with the Western intervention in Afghanistan was that it, it happened too late and then there hasn't been enough of it. Um, Iraq... I. I <laughs> The, the section on the immediately post-invasion Baghdad is an attempt to be honest about how confused I felt about it at the time, in that I was against the invasion uh, of Iraq. I was, however, heartily in favour of it being run by somebody else, um, having been there during the previous administration. Uh, and I still can't get out of my head what surprised me about that trip in 2003, which was the extraordinary optimism of the Iraqis. I met at that point. There's absolutely no gain saying that. There was enormous hope, um, no particular hostility towards um, American, American troops or even any other foreigner. And if you tried to undertake now, however, even a fraction of that time I spent in Baghdad, you'd be dead in minutes, looking like I do walking um, the streets of Baghdad. But at the time, um, I, I drove out, I, I remember, and I'm honest enough to admit it in the book, uh, in the context of everyone having decided the whole thing, and probably quite rightly is an unmitigated catastrophe, but I do remember driving out of Baghdad thinking, this may not have been such a bad idea. This could work, kind of. Obviously, you know, it hasn't. But, um, yeah, that was a very roundabout answer to a, what was a short question. Let's have another reading. Okay, um, this is a, a slightly an attempt to sort of prove the positive uh, or demonstrate the positive, and there are various examples in the book where I try to sort of offer a 
an indication of the way that things could work. Because and, and what I liked about this particular one was because it happened in the last place I expected to find it, which was Albania. Um, and I'd been sent there by an editor who basically thought it would be funny to send me to Albania, which was clearly just awful, and write you know 4,000 words of gallows humour about having an awful time in this awful place. Uh, and as I say in the book, after a few days, the photographer I was travelling with, the great David Sanderson, was the first one to crack and say, is it just me, or are we actually having quite a good time? Uh, which, which we were. Uh, and then we decided to write the story about yeah, Albania, it's great, and tried to figure out why. So we went out to meet um, the people, and um, one in particular, the then mayor of Tirana, I believe he still is mayor of Tirana, but he's also now leader of the Socialist Party, and with any luck, the next prime minister of Albania, so get used to him, uh, a man called Eddie Rama. Um, and this is a, an account of my, meet, my first meeting with Eddie. What startled us most were the colours. When the press shipped out of Tirana in 1999, it looked like a huge London council estate with some self-important government buildings. Tirana still had the self-important government buildings. There was the impressively ugly blue glass pyramid mausoleum erected to house Hosha's remains, which was now a disco. The dreary National History Museum, redeemed by the splendid socialist realist mosaic along its front. But every other building that faced the main street had been painted in lurid hues, yellow, green, pink, purple, black, orange, red, blue and silver, arranged in exuberant stripes, checks, polka dots and zigzags. Tirana looked like it had been assembled from gigantic licorice all sorts, and the effect was to make walking down any road a strangely joyous experience, the gleeful impudence of the colours and omnipresent affirmation of life's possibilities. When I asked Tyrannese what had transformed their city from a violent cesspit to such a vibrant, charmingly weird place, the answer, whether delivered with an amused smirk, a manic nod, or a roll of the eyes, was always one word, Eddie. Eddie was Eddie Rama, Tirana's mayor and its principal topic of conversation. A conceptual artist who'd spent much of his adult life in Paris, Eddie had run for office as an independent in 2000, age 36, and won a thumping mandate from an electorate weary of the sloth, stupidity and corruption of Albania's established parties. Tyrannese talked of Eddie as a colony of ants would talk of the bunger detonated in their nest. It had been Eddie marshalling Tirana's art students who'd painted the city, Eddie who'd bulldozed the illegal bars, brothels and casinos which had clogged Tirana's now verdant parks, Eddie who'd planted thousands of trees. And I'll skip forward a bit to his office. In person, Eddie did not disappoint. A couple of the legends that surrounded him were confirmed as truth as soon as we arrived at his offices. There was the surreal redecoration of City Hall, now touched with the arch postmodernism of an Ian Schrager hotel. Every wall painted as brightly as the rest of Tirana, one immense chandelier replaced by a vast hanging of garlic cloves. There were Eddie's staff, who looked like they'd been recruit recruited by going to the bar district one Friday night and hiring a dozen of the most beautiful women available, which, it would be remiss to admit, was saying something. Eddie's campaign against Tirana's potholes must have saved thousands of distracted male pedestrians, ourselves possibly included, from undignified plunges into sewers. Eddie greeted us from behind a wooden desk in the middle of a marbled floor which was inlaid with a mayoral seal of his own design. Behind him flew Albania's national flag, the splayed double-headed eagle on a blood-red background which looked unfortunately like roadkill, and the flag of the European Union, a universal Albanian desire. The walls were covered in a sepia panorama of 1930s Tirana divided by, divided by green marble pillars. The green and gold ceiling looked like it might have been looted from Uday Hussein's bathroom. I decorated this myself, explained Eddie, unnecessarily. <laughs> Eddie was wearing blue tartan trousers and an iridescent blue shirt, an outfit which looked particularly extraordinary on this six and a half foot tall bear of a man, covered with thick black hair everywhere except his head. <laughs> I made some remark about his height. I used to play basketball for Albania, he said. I asked if he'd been any good. No, he replied, just very tall. Eddie seemed tired. He'd just returned from a festival in Kosovo where, to the delight of Albania's television news programs, he'd made a guest appearance with an Albanian hip-hop group, Westside Family. He spoke English very slowly in a guttural drawl which sounded like an idling tank. The painting, he began, was because Tirana was in need of change and hope. After years of chaos, people had lost hope. Also, it's not too much of a strain on our finances. My budget is nothing point something. Almost as if worried that this sounded too prosaic, Eddie attempted the first of many ambitious metaphors. It's like you're on a boat cruising past a desert island and you see a fire. Someone's making a signal. This is not exactly like Robinson Crusoe, though. 
Eddie paused, sensing that the allegory was getting away from him. His head disappeared into, disappeared into his huge, hairy hands until he wrestled his thought to the ground. Those fires, he decided, suddenly remaking eye contact, said, don't leave without me. Ours are telling people not to get on the boat. The smile at this conclusion of this Cantonaresque flourish was one of triumph mixed with relief. Anyway, he continued, the catalog the invigorated, the colours are all my personal choice. I didn't want different neighbourhoods lighting different fires. The colours were intended as a shock. People were used to sleeping after they woke up. Their surroundings were grey and unchanging. There was resistance, but people got used to it, and the poorest country in Europe became like a Montmartre cafe, with everyone discussing colours. It was very strange. Well, I think if he becomes president, you'll be travelling on a fluorescent... Albanian diplomatic passport. <laughs> One would hope so. I, I quite fancy being their ambassador to Iceland. I, I, I reckon. Because <laughs> I, think, I, I reckon you, you could knock that off in a morning. You, well, uh, yeah, you, possibly an unfortunate well, turn exactly. of phrase for but, Iceland. But anyway, I mean, you know, but if you, would like to ask a question about Iceland, please do. There's nothing about Iceland in the book, but I, I do <laughs> recommend it. Yeah. I just hope they start a civil war and I can go as well. Um, <laughs> Does this go out live, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Iceland. <laughs> Take the Cod War to a whole new level. Anyway. We can um, go and start one. We could. <laughs> it's crossed my mind, so believe me, many a time. Many a time. Can you imagine? Anyway. Um, no, I lost am my now. train of thought yeah, there. Where so were we? We yeah. weren't in Reykjavik, were we? No, we were, we're here. So uh, to, 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 to wind up there, um, and we'll have some questions, mercifully. Um, we, we, we wouldn't start from here. It's all gone terribly wrong. So how do we, apart from painting our bottoms blue and our towns a mixture of different colours, where, how do we how do we get get out of this? Where where where, where do we go from here? Um, I can only answer that by saying that you know, I'd I'd be absolutely the last person I'd ask about any of that uh, because the, the other. The good side about getting to travel a lot is you do get to learn quite a lot. The downside is you just get increasingly confused about absolutely everything. Um, the only things I do just think are really obvious lessons, and they're the kind of obvious lesson you can draw just by looking at the absolute unarguable fact that in the entire history of ever, nobody has ever stowed away in a crate in the back of a truck to leave Amsterdam to start a new life in Kabul. That's just never happened, and it won't. Um, so all the basic stuff that I mentioned earlier, the democracy, free press, property rights, rule of law, pluralism, secularism, it all does actually work uh, really quite well, pretty much everywhere it's ever been attempted, whereas all the other stuff, or the polar opposites of those, the sort of tyranny, corruption, you know, making the law the servant of faith, without any exception I can think of, um, is invariably an unmitigated catastrophe. Quite what you do to get more people to apprehend that, though, I don't quite understand. And I, and if, and I can't even really pretend to have any particular prescription for that. If, I mean, if I could convincingly pretend to have some sort of prescription for that, then we could start a consultancy of some sort, or a think tank, do you, possibly do you, based in Reykjavik. Do you, do you <laughs> Or, or definitely. <laughs> um, do, do you, as, as a final question for me before everyone else um, pitches in, do, do you think that the, the invasions um, of Afghanistan and Iraq were a viable first step towards that, that vision? Uh, it's one of those questions that you can only answer answer with recourse to Gandhi's oft-quoted answer about the effects of the French Revolution, which is it's too soon to tell. Uh, and, and, and it really is. I, I, my suspicion is that five or ten years from now, Iraq will probably be more or less all right, um, which is not to validate what's been done or justify what's been done. That's just a reflection of the fact that Iraq had, and to an extent still has, a large educated, Western-looking, progressive, fa actually fairly secular um, population. And I think it will probably be OK. Uh, Afghanistan didn't have that, and I suspect is going to remain an extraordinary shambles for decades, uh, but basically for all those reasons. And I don't think there's an awful lot that can be done about that, realistically. 
isn't that fabulously optimistic, Nate? <laughs> All freighted with the it, caveat, it's, it's, but what do I know? Let's, um, let's, let, let's have some, some, some questions. If there are any. This lady here. If people could just say their names and any affiliation they have um, <laughs> for asking a question would be good. I'm Pony. Um, I'm a British citizen, but I happen to come from Sri Lanka. Have you ever wondered what it is like uh, uh, places where journalists are not allowed to go in? Yeah, such as, uh, Sri well, Lanka. Sri Lanka obviously being a case in point. I mean, yeah, you, you can only wonder about those places. I mean, there is, and it, it, it's always a, a thing that's very hard. Most journalists, most good ones anyway, will react by, to someone saying you can't go there and you can't do that by trying to go there and do that. Um, that has become increasingly difficult uh, because people are getting better at walling places off that and also because it for the very tedious reason that it just gets harder and harder to travel under any sort of assumed or bogus identity. In that, previous, say 10 or 15 years ago, even in a place which is shut down as the Sri Lankan conflict zone is, you could have pretended to be a tourist, you could have pretended to be something or other, but if you have any sort of name at all, all it takes is someone to type your name into Google and your cover's blown. The last time I was able to do anything like that was travel to Serbia uh, in 2000 when Milosevic was still in charge and they weren't admitting any Western journalists. Um, but they hadn't quite figured out how the whole internet thing worked in Serbia, or at least the government hadn't, which you know, it later to their, their considerable cost. And so myself and the photographer I was traveling with pretended that we were conceptual artists. Um, and bizarrely were granted visas on that basis. Even more bizarrely were actually, we, we were, I mean this is mentioned in the book, but we got, we got as far as the border having driven there from Budapest and just got seized with a sudden burst of what are we doing? We are going to end up hanging upside down in a dungeon in Belgrade for the next, and mercifully were confronted by a customs guard with a sense of humor uh, who it was a nice day and he'd been sitting outside with a cup of coffee in the, in the, in the newspapers and I think he realised that, well, I could bust this pair of idiots who clearly are journalists. But then you could just see him thinking, but then there'll be forms, there'll be phone calls. And he just went, get on the bus, go, go, get out, go, enjoy Belgrade. Um, you can't do that anymore, unfortunately. And I, and I know that's why um, Sri Lanka isn't, isn't covered nearly as much as it should be for exactly that reason. You just can't do it. Uh, and if a government is absolutely determined to make a place inaccessible and they're actually reasonably competent and organized, then it's extraordinarily difficult. The great thing about most tyrannies is that they're actually really badly run and badly organized and incredibly shambolic about policing these things. But that actually appears to be not the case, unfortunately, in Sri Lanka. But yeah, I'd love to go. But I just, it doesn't strike me as that likely. Any more questions? Nick. Uh, talking about tyrannies, I was um, brought, uh, talking about tyrannies, I was brought up in Australia. And um, <laughs> uh, uh, I came back many years later, about, about half a century later, and um, I interviewed to Bjarke Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he was white having his political clothes, and then I went out to um, a Baba gang, uh, where the Sergi Babas are, uh, who murdered Mackay. Mm. And I just thought my ideal uh, place to grow up in was Australia at that time. But I thought it, it had grown old very, very quickly. And I was very, very disappointed. Um, but I think what you're doing is, is an incredible thing because uh, one can easily go to Madison Avenue, which I was, advertising a toothpaste for 15 years, and then go into journalism. Um, and as Bertrand Russell said, the unexamined life isn't worth living. And I feel that you're being very modest and you've, you've had much more uh, serious escapades and you feel much more seriously about things than you've probably written. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for mentioning Joe Bjorki Peterson as well, which, which, which always gives those who know a laugh. He doesn't figure in the book, but he's the kind of person who could well have done. He was the Premier of Queensland in Australia for 
centuries, it felt like, like late early 70s to late 80s, I think, uh, when he finally became so completely corrupt and mad that even Queenslanders noticed. Um, <laughs> it, 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 there were many, many jokes that Australians used to tell about Joe Bjorki Peterson, um, the most signal of which was that Queensland obstinately refused to adjust to daylight saving time. Um, so it was an hour behind places on the same latitude, the joke being that Peterson's wife was concerned that the extra hour of daylight would fade her curtains. <laughs> These were the days. Any other questions? Clearly, we've covered everything. Oh, there's, there's, there's a lady there. There's always one. Thank you. I'll try and keep this brief. I do have a question. When Ireland was partitioned in 1921, the unionists, loyalist unionists, wanted to have a totally Protestant six counties British. Yep. And the nationalists weren't at all welcome there. If they didn't like things, they were told, there's the boat, there's the, there's the train, you can leave. They weren't but given any rights. You, you have to have a house to vote, mm -hmm. so they weren't given houses. They couldn't vote. Gerrymandering started there. Gerrymander was the man who moved the goalposts there. Yep. And, uh, and Britain just kept the lid on it. They didn't really want to know it as long as everything was peaceful. The nationals in Northern Ireland were inspired a lot by um, Dr. Martin Luther King. They yes. saw the similarity. And so they had marches, peaceful rallies, and got beaten up. And a, assaulted by the police and murdered by the British Army. We know that bloody Sunday. Mm. Now, they wanted to talk. Mm. Nobody would talk mm. to them. And a, a, an expression came out then by a very famous journalist, Danny, Danny Morrison. It's either the ballot box or the bomb. Now, that's how long it took till finally people would talk to them and we could have the ballot mm. box and not the bomb. And my, my question to you is, you say, couldn't there have been another way when you talk to Jerry Adams and the board? If nobody will speak to you and you want equal rights, d does it come to the ballot box or the bomb? And that's what happened there because nobody wanted to know. It's, a, it's an absolutely excellent question and a very, very fair one uh, in that you know, absolutely everything you say about what life was like for Catholics and nationalists in Northern Ireland in the late 60s, early 70s, absolutely true, and not a single serious or sane person would deny it. The, the case advanced by the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland at that point is absolutely unanswerable. Uh, and I have to say, you would have to go a long way even into the, the wackier fringes of loyalism in Northern Ireland now to find somebody who would seriously argue with that. Um, the question you ask, and it's, it is one of the key questions, at what point do you realise that we're not going to get what we want by being nice guys? Um, and it is one that is a difficult one to answer, except by observing that if people can maintain that, and, and it does take, well, superhuman seems a reasonable word, resolve in a lot of cases, but it almost always works eventually. It actually does almost always work eventually. And it's... It's a very, di but it's a very difficult thing, and to which there's no magic formula. But I remember having this discussion, and I'm pretty sure it's mentioned in there, with, you know, in, in much the same way that no serious or sane person would argue the case on just the grounds of basic human rights, as far as the Palestinians are concerned. Um, the sort of ludicrous sort of oppressions and nonsense they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are its. There's, there's no arguing with it at all. But I remember talking to a lot of people, and I was, I was, in, I was in, uh, on the West Bank when Ariel Sharon was elected Prime Minister of Israel in, in 2000, and trying to make the case to people that all that has to happen is for you not to bite. Just don't. Obviously, you know, there's a signal being sent here by the election of a creature like Sharon to Israel's Prime Ministership. Just don't give him what he wants. Um, and in a case like that where they would have had the, and indeed do have extraordinary uh, attention of the world's media on what is in the grand scheme of things quite a small conflict, uh, I, I really do think, and I don't think this is naive of me at this point, that that particular one can be, a, an enormous advantage can be secured by the first of the two parties willing to not to descend to the level of the other one. But it, it does take, it, it, I mean, I suspect greater reserves of, you know, patience and courage than, for example, I would have. So, yeah, it's a fair question to which I have no satisfactory answer. Time for one last question. Hi. Um, do you, 
what what do you think um, will be the the out the ultimate outcome in Palestine and Israel? Because I'm going to Beirut in a couple of weeks, and I okay, it won't be fixed by then. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just wonder because you've spent a lot of time there. Do you think it'll be a two-state area, or is it possible? What I mean, what do you think the the best possible outcome could be? Uh, yeah, that's an easy one. Um, and do remember what you say will be on the internet forever. Forever, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to make it clear. <laughs> Thank you, James. I agree with absolutely everybody in the Middle East about everything, whatever it is they think. Um, no, the. The closest I get to giving any sort of answer uh, of that in the book, and I, I quoted him for a reason, which was I was speaking to a shopkeeper in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem around the time of Sharon's election, in fact, it was on that trip. He was a guy called Max uh, from Melbourne, it turned out, but he lived in Jerusalem for a very long time, and things obviously at that point were a bit sketchy. And I sort of did throw him the grand question, you know, what do you think? And to which he replied, and I suspect he'd practiced this one, to be honest, because the timing was perfect and it, a lot better than mine's going to be, I suspect. He said, no, he said, I think, I think there will be a solution. I, I think there will be a solution, perhaps in you know, 50 to 100 years' time, but I am an optimist. There we go. I actually completely misread the time there. If there is anyone who has a, a last question, we can fit one in. And gentleman over here in the blue shirt. Hi. Um, First, just going back to what you said about Hezbollah. Yeah. Um, what do you think Hezbollah is? Do you think it's a sort of grassroots resistance movement? Uh, is it more it's, it's Syrian? That, it's that Syrian and Iranian plenty more to so besides. Obviously, they are backed financially and politically by Syria and Iran, and they don't make any attempt to you know, dispute that when you ask them, which does rather take the wind out of your sails. You sort of say, you're backed by Syria and Iran. They go, yeah, we are. It's like, ah, OK. But, um, th but there is, and like I said, wouldn't vote for them myself. But yeah, the, the, there's, they're, they're, the scale of their organization is uh, extraordinary. They run, obviously, they, they have a fairly serious military wing, but they, they run very well-appointed hospitals, not just for their veterans, but just generally. They run schools. They own construction companies, sports clubs. Uh, what was at the time, this was obviously before summer of 2006, what was at the time an extraordinarily professional and well set up television station, radio station, which I think still broadcasts because they had backup um, provisions for that in the event of their headquarters getting knocked down, which, which did happen. Um, they are a uh, yeah, they're a, they're a really serious enterprise. They're, 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 they are, they're kind of um, yeah, sort of like a, like a Lebanese Fox News with an armed wing, really, uh, which is a terrifying thought. Well, literally terrifying thought. Uh, but yeah, no, the, 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 the scale of their operation, I, I was genuinely startled by. It's enormous. Most of Fox News' armed wing, which is the, <laughs> the US Army. The US Army, yeah, a fair point, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, do we, uh, they, any, they do uh, at least maintain a certain <laughs> amount of plausible deniability between Fox yes, News yeah. and the, and the yes. US military. It's good night from me and shalom from Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> any, uh, any, any uh, an honestly genuine, absolutely final question before we all escape yeah. out of the back? The, 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 phrase, <laughs> the, the, the phrase final question could have... Um, yeah. the, the, this, think, is, this is going out live, is it? Well, it is actually. I mean, uh, if any, I'm not going to make that joke because I absolutely <laughs> won't get away with it. I'm just wondering how long it takes to get the GPS coordinates for a Hellfire say, missile. But anyway, is the, is the address on the website? Yes. No, we're at number 22 <laughs> Lancaster Gate. Um, <laughs> any, any, <laughs> any final questions, or can we have a beer? Oh, there's one there, Claudio. Okay, there we go. Far away. Uh, yeah, Claudio from Plant. I'm. Uh, documentary filmmaker. Uh, I was just wondering, based on your experience, you know, in all these different corners around the world, um, when it comes to international pressure to kind of try to kind of solve conflicts, you know, there are different attempts, you know, there are sanctions or, you know, you can do kind of the, the Iraq version, you just invade the place. Um, what are your views? What does work and what doesn't work? And, and you know, do you have any 
suggestions in future how things should be handled in the 21st century. Or you can, you can have the kind of the Chinese approach in Africa, where basically you just don't care. You just, you just go and... Of, you just try to make business. And, you just um, go and buy it, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, well, obviously with the caveat that all my opinions on such things are fairly meaningless and the extremely unlikely, regrettably, event of being, being elected supreme lord of everything any time in the near future. Um, there isn't a short answer to that either, but uh, I'm just always struck by the fact that people keep attempting the same things over and over again which don't work despite the fact that they don't work. Uh, it's that definition of insanity, I think, often attributed to Einstein, that it is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. Uh, and if there is one sort of central point from the book, and the reason I mention people like you know, Eddie Rama in Tirana, and I spend a lot of time with the, those youth-led um, civil rights movements in Eastern Europe, you know, Oppor in Serbia and Mjaft in Albania, Khmer in Georgia, that sort of overthrew corrupt governments is that with a bit of imagination and wit applied uh, and just by thinking in a different, thinking in a way that your, your adversary is not expecting, you can really just zone people out complacent, completely. Milosevic has, for example, had run a very typical, very old school police state for a very long time and then was confronted with a large mass movement, largely led by you know, university students and people of that age who just laughed at him. Uh, and he didn't know what to do with it. And the, the, the book is intentionally funny for, because funny things do happen in conflict zones and people use laughter as a way of staying sane, but it's an, it's an incredibly powerful weapon. Um, a dictator, can, a, a dictator cannot last if he's being ridiculed. He cannot, he can, he, he's finished as soon as his people stop taking him seriously. And that happened with Milosevic. Um, I, I was stunned in the beginning of 2000 to go to what was still the capital of a tyranny and see openly for sale people um, selling sarcastic postcards of Milosevic. There was, um, and I bought many of them, but there was one of a, a cartoon of him holding a gun to his head. Of, and with the caption in Serbian, save Serbia, kill yourself, with his address printed on the back. The idea being that you could just buy the postcard, you know, stick a stamp on it and it would go straight to his house. Um, <laughs> when, when that starts happening, you know, the, 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 the clock is ticking. And uh, again, it takes extraordinary bravery to do that because, uh, I mean, Oppor in particular, as one of their activists, Branko Willich, described them to me, were guerrillas without guns. He said, that, that's what we did. We ran a guerrilla movement but a completely unarmed one. But it was brilliant, and it worked. They had backing, certainly, from you know, outside, from foreign governments hostile to Milosevic, America and Britain specifically. But it was just, I, I just found it really inspiring. I think there are enormous possibilities there. Just to, a, a dictatorship can't keep up with that. I mean, the, the brilliant, it's just one example of Oppor's thinking. Uh, if you weren't thinking ahead, you, and you were trying to set up a movement like Oppor, you would probably build, you know, print T-shirts and flags with, you know, he has to go, or you know, Milosevic out, or even save Serbia, kill yourself. They didn't do that. They came up with a slogan, which was a brilliant piece of copywriting, which could be put on any T-shirt, any flat surface in Belgrade. And it was, it was everywhere, which was, and I'm almost certainly going to mispronounce this, the Serbian phrase "gotov je," which just meant he's finished. Not he has to go, or we want to get rid of him. Just saying he's finished. And this was when he was still in power but all over his capital. There's no mention of his name, no picture of him, but just everywhere you look, the two words, he's finished. And you do that enough, it, beca it, was, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and he didn't understand what was going on at all. Dictators understand armed resistance because they're violent in themselves. They don't understand that. And it, you know, they end up looking like you know, someone trying to kill wasps with a chainsaw, you know, undignified, really. But it works, it really does. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for a really a really great chat. It's now be a migration down to the bar. Thank you very much. Thank you.